So I'm the Chief Medical Officer of Organovo. We're a San Diego, California-based biotechnology company, about 60 employees, been incorporated since around 2007, uh, and been a public company for about five or, or six years. So these are our forward-looking statements. I won't dwell on those. So I'm going to talk a little bit about our core technology, which is bioprinting of, um, of human cells. So in fact, can bioprint any type of cells, but we're focusing on human cells. I'll talk about our lead clinical program, which is um, liver tissue. Um, this isn't in the clinic yet, but we're planning to get into human clinical trials um, towards the end of next year. And then I'll show you some data briefly from a couple of um, models of inborn areas of metabolism. So this is our, a schematic, really, of our bioprinting process. So um, our company was founded uh, around the technology for bioprinting. We can print three-dimensional tissues using multiple different cell types. Um, we have a number of programs in-house, and uh, the, the organization has two kind of components to the business. One is bioprinting of, um, of human tissues for drug testing. And for that, the, the lead program is, um, is liver tissue, and we can um, develop various models of liver disease for testing drugs for therapeutic benefit, and we can also um, print normal human liver tissue for testing drugs for toxicity, etc., for screening of, of, school, of small molecules. And we have a number of big and small industry uh, customers that we use on that side of the business. And then the other side of the business is, is, the, th is the therapeutic side, and that's what I'm going to be talking about today. So essentially, um, for our lead program, we take uh, human hepatocytes and non-parenchymal cells that have been isolated from livers, high-quality livers that have been given up for transplantation, but for one reason or another haven't made it into the patient uh, as a transplant. Um, we bring those in-house to our manufacturing facility where we basically digest out the different cells and centrifuge them down to separate them. And we take out um, human hepatocytes, we take out stellate cells, and we take out um, endothelial cells. And those, we expand the non-parenchymal cells. At present, we don't have technology available for expanding the, the hepatocytes, but we're working on partnering in that technology. And we, we expand them up through five or six different cycles, and then we freeze the cells down until they're, they're needed. At the time that we need to print tissues, we thaw the cells out, we mix them into a proprietary hydrogel, and then we print them using our bioprinters. And our bioprinters can print in, in about, well, we say four dimensions, because we can print in the three X, Y, and Z dimensions, but we can also print tissues and then go back and print other layers of tissues on top over time. So if we look just at the, uh, is the pointer working? Oops. Okay, the point is not working. If you look at the top right there, you can see a thing that looks like a square egg. Um, that's one of, one of our tissues. So this is what we call a biotherapeutic liver tissue, and, and these tissues are modular and they're scalable. So if we look there, that's a single module, and that's about three quarters of a centimeter along each dimension. And it consists of um, hepatocytes, stellate cells, um, liver endothelial cells, and also human umbilical vein cells. Um, as I say, this is scalable. In other words, this is a, an individual module, and we can link these modules together to form tissues of, of any size. What we're planning to take into humans is approximately 25 of these linked together in a five by five structure. When we go into rodents for our animal models, we dose them with one, two, or four of these as a construct so that we can look at dose response. Our initial non uh, our initial animal studies were just done with single BTLTs, um, and that's the data that I'm going to present you today. So these patches are introduced into the mice onto the surface of the liver, um, where they're, they're attached to the, to the liver capsule. Initially, in our, in our rodent studies, we were suturing them on using two or four sutures, but more recently, we've transitioned to using uh, fibrin glue, uh, which is quicker, easier, to fix the patches on and seems to perform at least as well, if not better, in terms of engraftment of the tissues on the mice. So um, this is in vitro characteristics of, of the product. You can see they, this is just three proteins here. We screen for a whole range of different proteins, and this shows that the, 
um, in vitro, the patches continue to produce um, liver proteins over quite an extended period of time. And then this is histology following engraftment. What we see is that within the first seven days, we get vessel ingrowth from the mouse liver into the patch, and we also get organization of the Huvex and the liver endothelial cells within the patches to form a network of, um, of blood vessels. And then by day 28, we, have, uh, we can see blood actually perfusing through those blood vessels as well. Um, this is mirrored by protein production. So as the patch is engraft, we also see human proteins circulating in the mouse plasma, and we can do ELISA testing specifically to look for any number of, mass pro of human proteins. Typically, we look for alpha-1 antitrypsin and albumin. So at this point in time, we're um, expecting to have a pre-IND meeting with FDA sometime later this year to discuss our clinical plan. And if all of that goes uh, according to plan, then we, we should be in a position to conduct um, our chronic toxicology studies towards the end of this year, moving into next year, and then to commence human clinical trials towards the end of next year. There are a number of potential clinical applications um, for, for this type of tissue. Um, and just to remind you, it is allergenic tissue. So um, patients that are receiving these patches will need to be immunosuppressed. In the mice, we put the tissues in using open surgery. In humans, they'll be applied to the surface of the liver using a laparoscopic technique, so it's not an open technique. And also in the humans, we also have all of the, the omentum as, um, as additional real estate that we can put the patches onto. If we need to get more liver tissue into the patients, then we can accommodate on the surface of the liver alone. So um, at the moment, we're exploring uh, various types of hepatic failures. So our initial clinical trial will probably be in adult patients with, um, with hepatic failure um, that are on the transplant wait list as a bridge to transplantation. We're also exploring acute on chronic liver failure. And if we can um, get to, uh, the tissues to be able to be manufactured in a shorter period of time so we can do just-in-time manufacture, that also opens up acute liver failures as an avenue for, for treatment. And then in addition to that, um, there's also a whole host of inborn errors of metabolism where there's a single gene defect that primarily affects, um, primarily affects an enzyme uh, within the liver um, that are amenable to, to this form of treatment because essentially we're, we're replacing the, the normal enzyme. But again, in, in these uh, diseases we're, for the inborn errors of metabolism, primarily we're seeing this as a bridge to transplantation. So for many of these diseases, um, the severely affected kids need a transplant but you can't really transplant infants within the first four to six months of life. Their abdomens just aren't big enough to take a liver fraction. But at the same time, they suffer from quite considerable morbidity as a consequence of the disease. So by the time they get old enough and large enough to have a transplant, they're not really in great shape in many cases. So what we're hoping is that provide, by providing normal liver tissue, we can bridge them through to transplantation so they arrive at the transplant in much, much better shape than they otherwise would have. So I'm just going to show you some data now from a couple of animal models um, that, that we've conducted. And these are animal models of, of uh, human inborn errors of metabolism. The first is hereditary tyrosinemia type 1. So this is a schematic of the, um, of the, uh, uh, the uh, enzymatic pathway here. And these infants have FAH um, deficiency, which is fumaroleacetoacetate um, uh, hydrogenase. Um, the red box there, um, just below it, you can see a line that shows the level of the deficiency. And so by failing to be able to metabolize these, um, th these uh, proteins, I guess, down through the pathway, you get buildup of toxic metabolites above it and also in sideways pathways. And these toxic me metabolites <coughs> cause primarily hepatocyte damage. So these kids develop liver failure within the first few years of life, and they also have a very high risk of hepatocellular carcinoma, and then some of the other toxic metabolites also lead to eye problems and, and lead to uh, peripheral neuropathies. Um, going into the pathway above is tyrosine and phenylalanine. So this is a metabolic pathway for both tyrosine and phenylalanine. So in the absence of treatment, these kids need to be on a tyrosine and phenylalanine uh, controlled diet. And Generally speaking, the very severely affected children um, uh, often need to have a hepatic transplant within the first few years of life. So um, our tissues 
our human tissues going into a mouse, so we need to use immunocompromised mice. And the mice that we use um, in this, uh, for this particular model have both FIH deficiency, which is the enzyme deficiency, and they also have a RAG2 knockout, and they also have an IL2RG knockout, which renders their, their T cells, B cells, and natural killer cells uh, non-functional. So this is data from this. So uh, the mice uh, that have FIH deficiency are really sick, and you need to treat them um, with NTBC, which is a chemical that blocks flow down through the metabolic pathway for tyrosine at a higher level than the FAH deficiency and prevents buildup of the toxic metabolites. So these mice, if they're on a, a diet where they have unrestricted access to the NTBC, they live normally, um, they don't show any signs of, of liver disease. If you don't give them NTBC, they die very quickly within a matter of a few weeks. And so in the mouse model, so that we can get enough liver toxicity in order to be able to show a benefit, we do what's called cycling of the NTBC. So they have NTBC for a few days, then they'll have one or two weeks off NTBC, and then they'll go back onto NTBC again. So we can see here there's two studies in, in mice here. Um, if you look on the left-hand side in the first study, the blue line at the top there is mice that have continuous access to NTBC, so you can see that they have normal survival for, for this mouse model. And then the other two lines represent um, mice that have been treated with our uh, liver patches, and at the bottom, mice that aren't treated with anything other than the cycled NTBC. And we can, you can see that we get an approximate third to um, increase in the lifespan of these mice by about a third to 50%. And again, this has been repeated in a second study where we showed very similar effect. You can also see that the, the health of the mice generally is improved. The top line is, the, again, the mice that have continuous access to NTBC. This is a growth curve for the mice. And although we don't return growth to completely normal, it is significantly better than mice that don't have access to, uh, to continuous NTBC or, or mice that have been treated with, with the patches. So in this mouse model, we do see a clear uh, benefit in the um, FAH deficient mice that we're hoping will translate into a clinical benefit in, in human studies. Um, the other thing that we can look at is the uh, tyrosine levels and the phenylalanine levels because this is the metabolic pathway for tyrosine and phenylalanine. When you block that pathway, the, the levels of the circulating levels of tyrosine and phenylalanine go up. And what we can see here is that we get a, um, a reduction in both um, uh, tyrosine and phenylalanine, and also methionine, a significant reduction in these metabolites, which is compatible with increased flow of these amino acids through the metabolic pathway. In other words, an improvement in the enzyme activity within the met metabolic pathway. And we also see an improvement in the liver function tests of these animals. Here we can see on the left is uh, ALT, and on the right is gamma GT. The red dots are the um, mice that didn't receive our liver patches, and the green dots are the, are the mice that did receive the liver patches. And you can see that in both studies, um, right out through uh, 44 days post-implantation, generally speaking, the green dots are, are lower than the red dots. So the, the mice have, have improved health by both measures of liver function test, overall survival, and their growth curves. Um, these are the... So this is um, mice, again, within the same study. Um, here, what we've done is to tag the hepatocytes that go into the patch with a near-infrared um, uh, fluorescent dye. And then an in, vi an in vivo imaging system is used um, in the live mice to actually have a look to see how long the hepatocytes are sticking around in their liver. And at the time that this, uh, this data was generated, the study was still ongoing. But we can see here that the... Um, the uh, we're seeing fluorescence in the active treated mice right out there um, for, for quite a number of days. And as we've collected the final data for this study, this continues, continues out for several weeks more. So the next um, inborn error of metabolism I just want to talk about is alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. So alpha-1 antitrypsin is an enzyme um, of that is secreted by the liver, secreted by hepatocytes, and it has an important function in the lungs, whereby it inhibits neutrophil elastase. So patients with uh, alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency can develop severe emphysema in adulthood, 
but also the alpha-1 antitrypsin that's produced is abnormal and it dumps out inside the hepatocyte causing insoluble globules and these globules interfere with hepatic function and over time can cause cirrhosis and hepatocellular carcinoma. In infancy, about 10 to 15% of infants can develop acute liver failure as a, as a consequence of having alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency and about half of those need to have a transplant. So um, we've, there are a number of different isoforms of alpha-1 antitrypsin, uh, a number of different abnormal isoforms. The most severe um, phenotype comes with the Z isoform, and so um, this disease is generally studied in mouse models in, a, in mice that have a, a Z mutant transgene. So in other words, the human Z form gene is put into the mouse, and this is what we've done our studies in. Down the bottom right there, you can see accumulation of the globules within the hepatocytes, and that's what they look like. Um, so we put our patches, single patch, into mice um, that had the, the Z-form transgene. Uh, these mice were also on an immune-deficient background as well. And what we can see here is that we see albumin secretion and alpha-1 antitrypsin secretion. So these are human proteins detectable in, in the mouse plasma uh, to about 90 days. But more interestingly, what we saw was a significant reduction in the globule formation in these mice. So going out from day seven to day 125, the untreated animals are on the top there. You can see the globules quite prominently displaying in their hepatocytes, whereas the mice that were treated with our uh, tissue patches, there's really quite considerable clearing out of the globules. And this is statistically significant with a difference of about 70 to 80% between, between the two treatment groups.